My guest today is the best-selling author of The Miracle Morning and is also one of the highest rated keynote speakers in America. His book has sold over 600,000 copies worldwide. It's been translated into over 27 languages. Uh, over half a million people are actually practicing The Miracle Morning every single day in over 70 countries worldwide. Um, after literally dying, dying in a car crash at the age of 20, um, how I was hit on, uh, head on by a uh, drunk driver at 70 miles per hour, he died for six minutes, broke 11 bones, suffered permanent brain damage, and when he woke up in a hospital bed, uh, he was told by doctors he would never walk again. Hal took his first steps three weeks later, and not only did he walk again, he went on to become an ultra marathon runner, uh, Hall of Fame business achiever, record-breaking sales rep, like best-selling author. He's got one of the top uh, personal development podcasts on iTunes. Um, he's a devoted husband and father. I mean, just absolute, like, just amazing. Like, when we talk about, like, game changers, I mean, Hal is most definitely the definition of that. So, Hal, very, very grateful and, and, uh, and honored to, uh, uh, to have you on with us. Michael, dude, it's, it is a pleasure, man. I'm, I'm so looking forward to uh, your event coming up here. So I've, I've got to start off by asking just like, what, what's your why, right? Like why, like when you even started, like why did you share Miracle Morning with the world and, and why do you do what you do every day? Yeah, um, for me, the, my why was developed when, uh, really when I was 20, I was in that car accident that you just mentioned, hit head on by a drunk driver. And as I was in the hospital pondering, you know why this happened to me i was trying i wasn't i was trying really really striving to not do it from a victim mentality like why did this happen to me i'm a good person i don't you know i'm never going to walk again like are you kidding me um it was a it was a why did this happen to me what can i what is the purpose behind this in fact here's the way that i looked at it is you know there's there's that old adage everything happens for a reason but I think so often we're looking outside of ourselves for the reason. We're looking to God, God, why did this happen to me? Or we're asking other people. And, and I really believe that everything does happen for a reason, but not in the way that most of us have been conditioned to think. Um, the difference is it's our responsibility to choose the reason. And, and we have the opportunity and the responsibility to choose the reason that will empower us, that will serve us, that will serve humanity. And for me, I thought, when I was in my car accident, I thought, um, I, you know, how can I use this experience to grow and to become a better version of myself and help other people? And, and I might not have, you know, been that articulate, but, but that's what I was looking for. And, and, and the, there's a, one funny story, which is, you know, the doctors thought I was in denial because I was so happy. They thought I was delusional, right? I was always positive and smiling and joking. And they thought that this kid's lost it, man. He's checked out. And my dad came in and was talking to me about how I was trying to get to the bottom of my feelings and get me to really admit that I was probably depressed or angry or scared or, you know, whatever it was. And I said, Dad, I've accepted this. And I said, look, I always wanted to be a motivational speaker, right? I'd been speaking for companies, my company for about a year and a half. I said, I've been wanting to be a motivational speaker, but you and mom were really good to me. Like I had a normal life. I, I never really had anything to talk about. You know, I don't know what I would speak on. And I said, maybe that's why this happened to me. Maybe I'm meant to overcome this adversity and use it to help other people overcome their adversity. And, uh, and that's really what happened. I took on a sense of responsibility and I believe we all have a sense of responsibility, whether you want to change the world or just, or just change your world. You know, if you want to impact impact millions of people or just impact your family, right? We have a responsibility, I believe, to take life head on, to, to fulfill our own potential so that we can then help other people, inspire others to do the same. And, uh, and so that was it. I, I left the hospital. I took my first step and I went and I started speaking at high schools and eventually colleges, sharing my story, paying it forward. Fast forward that was in 1999 when the car accident happened. Fast forward to 2007, the, the economy crashed, right? And when that happened, I kind of crashed with it. And I ended up going through a deep depression and lost my house to the bank, you know, foreclosure, all of these things. And I, uh, after about six months of this downward spiral, I, I, I asked myself, what do the world's most successful people do every day that I don't do? You know, I got what are they, what are their rituals? What are their routines? Because if I do what they do, I'll start to become the type of person that they are and, and I can change things. And I kept coming across morning routines and morning rituals, but I wasn't a morning person. It was like, no, no, no. What else do they do? Like where, where's the night owl plan for success? Right. And long story short, I finally decided that if I want my life to be different, if I want my success to elevate, 
I have to be different. I have to elevate myself first. And so I created, I, I attempted to create, you know, the most extraordinary, effective, scientifically proven personal development routine, morning routine, if you will, um, of all time. And, uh, and it wasn't a book idea. There was no, no plan of anything out. I was just trying to, I was just trying to save my own life, you know, if you will, and, um, turn things around for me. And my life changed so fast that in, within two months, I more than doubled my income. I went from being in the worst shape of my life physically. I hadn't exercised in six months because when my income dropped, I canceled the gym membership and just went to my office every day. Um, I, I, I decided to run that 52 mile ultra marathon and, and keeping a long story short, my life changed so fast. I had that same kind of inspiration of, wait a minute, if this morning ritual, this miracle morning, as I'm you know calling it in my schedule, if this changed my life this fast, and I'm not a morning person, like this could change anybody's life. And so then I felt that same, and I don't exactly know where that sense of responsibility comes from, Michael, but, but that is my why, is I feel a responsibility to live to my full potential, to overcome my adversity and my challenges. And, and then as I do, and, and, and do, in doing so, I feel responsible to help other people, to pay it forward and help them do the same. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, two, a little over two years ago, I was diagnosed with a very rare aggressive form of cancer. And within a week or two, you know, I was given a 30% chance of surviving. And within a week or two, I was recording video blogs to help other people get through their challenges or their cancer. You know what I mean? So, so, and I don't say that, you know, to boast or brag, but like that for whatever reason, I've got this weird, you know, inborn why of like, I in the test, kind of like Tim Ferriss, right? Like I'm the test dummy, uh, you know, and, and, and I, whatever works for me, whatever I feel like can help and serve other people, I feel responsible to, to live my life doing that. So uh, I, I, that's a long answer, but there's your answer. <laughs> well, I remember, I mean, several months back, I was, I was on a flight and I actually, I had like the book with me and I was like, all right, it, let, let me check this thing out. I mean, I think I'm 10 pages in and, and I'm messaging our team. I'm like, we've got to get, this guy to our conference to, to speak to, like to, to everybody there because our, our conference being very much like a, uh, a law firm growth conference, we talk about every, every aspect from personal development to business growth. And I think that your mindset is probably the most important thing always, right? I think that, and you get to different levels when you're growing a business where you're growing personally or professionally, it's really upgrading your mindset uh, because that's going to dictate not only how you think about things, but the actions that you take. And uh, in particular, like you've not had an easy road but you've been able to experience the other side. So perhaps, and, and I can relate to this to some extent in that because you have been on the other side, when you see other people who are also struggling and you know that you, you've been there, right? And you know that you can be, you can actually drive change in your life that it doesn't, you don't have to settle for those present conditions or those situations. It, that perhaps that's the reason why uh, you're so drawn to being able to pay that forward because to, to let people know that it doesn't have to be that way, right? They, they'll tell you you'll never walk again, but that's, you know, that, that may be their belief, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case because it certainly wasn't the case for you. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I had a realization the other night. I, I do I do this uh, thing almost every night. I do what I call, I'm, I'm calling the miracle evening. I've had a lot of people request like, are you ever going to write the miracle evening, you know? And, and I've always said, maybe, maybe, maybe. And then a few months ago, I started like taking time at night. And the first time it happened on accident, but I had like this just like I was laying down to bed and and thinking, what should I be thinking about before bed, right? Like, what would be ideal? Because I know the power of, you know, when you're in that alpha state, you're falling asleep, programming your mind, you know, in the first thing in the morning, which is my area of expertise, if you will, the miracle morning. But then at night, I wasn't taking advantage of that. I would just go to sleep and drift off and, and use it with no intention. And the other night, I realized one of my epiphanies was um, that, uh, yeah, that I, that I, I don't view an I. Um, uh, I only view a we. Right. Like, I don't think that I am better than any person. I don't think I am in superior. Like, I, I really feel that we're all equals. We're all on the same page. Right. And, and, and it's this we and and, you know, in my mission in life, you know, you ask me my why the way that I define my mission, it's to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time, one person at a time. And um, yeah, and it's that view of we. And I think if we all take that, you know, there, there's one of my mentors years ago used to say there's there's two ways to get what you want in life. You can try to get everything you want in life, or you can give as you can, you know, you can try to get as much as you can, or you can focus on giving as much as you can. And either way, those are two different ways to get what you want in life, right? But one 
is very selfish and it doesn't help anybody else and you don't make as many friends on the way, right? And the other, giving as much as you can, um, that actually will amplify your circle of influence. It will amplify your impact. It will it will create more resources uh, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I think that seed planted when I was like 21, you know, really started to shift me in that direction of, yeah, and, and, and Zig Ziglar said it really well. You can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people what you get what they want in life. And it's interesting, but when you really focus, like you really shift your focus on not what do I want this year, right? That's okay, but, but, but what, what do I want? And in the context of how can I serve other people to get, help them get what they want and, and then in turn, I'll, I'll get what I want. And so I think that focus on we, focusing on the greater good, focusing on serving, you know, and, and that's across the board. If you're in, you know, in law, if you're in whatever your business is, right, the, the principle is universal. And I think it's one of the most important. Agreed. So, so talk about, I guess, from the standpoint of Miracle Morning, right? Why not Miracle Afternoon? Everyone's got different personal development strategies. Why focus on, on the morning? In fact, the very first thing that you do when you wake up. Yeah, so there are six practices that make up the Miracle Morning, right? And the acronym SAVERS is these six practices, and we can get more into those. But um, the uh, uh, I, 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 the question I get sometimes is similar to that, right? Which is like, but specific, they'll say, well, could I do my SAVERS in the afternoon? Or could I do my SAVERS in the evening and, and get the same impact? Um, and the answer is, uh, well, the answer is no, kind of, but no. And, and, and the reason is this, uh, so I'll run through these real quick. So it's silence, right? The first S in savers is silence or meditation or prayer, um, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, uh, and scribing, which is a fi fancy word for writing, right? Um, any one of those practices done any part of the day will, you will receive benefits from that, right? You meditate any time of the day, it's going to, you know, it will lower your cortisol levels and therefore lower your stress levels. It will increase your clarity, your ability to, you know, your cognitive abilities. I mean, there's so many benefits, but here's the point. How you start your day sets your mindset for the rest of your day. It sets the direction. It sets the tone. And in other words, in, in simple terms, if you win the morning, right? Then you put yourself in an optimum state to win the day. So if you put yourself in an optimum physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual state first thing in the morning, then you are optimizing yourself and therefore every, everything you do for the rest of the day is, it benefits from that. For example, if you exercise in the evening or in the afternoon, right? You get the blood flow and the oxygen flow in. That also helps you think clearer. It gives you more energy. It releases serotonin. You feel better, right? Um, why would you want to delay the benefits of exercise until the afternoon or the evening? Now you've missed out on, you know, four hours, six hours, eight hours of energetic as well as cognitive benefits that that exercise would have provided had it been done in the morning. Same thing. Why would you want to wait until you've been had a stressed out day to meditate and lower your stress? Like, I, you know, if you're going to meditate in the evening, that's great. Do both. But, but don't, don't, don't miss out on the benefit in the morning, right? Journaling, scribing, as it's called in the miracle morning, uh, the benefits of putting pen to paper and the clarity that that provides, writing down what you're grateful for, looking over your to-do list and simply writing out, okay, I've got 20 things on my to-do list. Which are the, what's the number one thing I'm committed to do today that'll make the biggest impact in my life and in my business? Okay, what are my top three, right? Really getting clarity in writing. So the point is, you could do these any time of day, but you're going to miss, but until you do the savers, you've missed out on the benefits of the savers until the time you actually do them. So first thing in the morning is ideal. Um, and the other thing I'll say on that is if anybody's watching this or they're listening, they're thinking, yeah, but I'm not a morning person, Hal, right? And Michael, I'm not a morning person. And maybe they're even thinking, I've tried. I've, I've already, tr like I've tried and I've failed. Like it, it, I am just, I am a night owl. No, you're not. Um, now there, there are, uh, now I, 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 I'm sure there are people that would conflict with this, but, but here's what I will tell you. Well, I'll tell you two things. I'll give you a very powerful piece of a statistic. Um, and that is, uh, we surveyed our community once I was asked, you know, hundreds of thousands of people do the miracle morning. And somebody in an interview said, what percentage of your community were already morning people? So this was easy. They just stopped checking email first thing or Facebook and they did their savers instead, but they were already waking up early, early was no problem. And what percentage of your community had never been a morning person before? So this was a radical shift in even their 
a, 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 I call it a limiting belief that says like, I can't be a morning person, right? I can't beat the snooze button. And I, I did not know the answer. And so we surveyed our community and hundreds of thousands of people. I was, I didn't know, the, I didn't know if it was going to be 90% said I was already a morning person or I, I had no idea. 72% of, of Miracle Morning practitioners said they had never in their entire life been able to succeed at becoming a morning person until they read the Miracle Morning. And so that blew me away. So I thought only 38 or no, 28% were already morning people. 72% were not. So if you're watching this, you, you know, if, if you're like, I'm not a morning person, join the club. Neither was I and neither were hundreds of thousands of people that are now morning people. And so, um, so those are important components. I think that, yeah, having a morning routine is crucial. And this isn't about waking up early, by the way, you don't have to work at wake up at an ungodly hour. In fact, I'll, I'll give a little spoiler alert at the, at the, uh, at the conference, when I speak, um, we're going to end, I'll end my message with a 30 day miracle morning challenge. And the, for one of the parts of the challenge is all you do is wake up 30 minutes earlier right? It's, it's nothing radical. It's not that if you wake up at seven, now you got to get up at four or five, you know, no, it's, you back it up 30 minutes, just a little bit, just enough time to get that time to get focused, centered, have a growth oriented, goal oriented morning to lead into a more effective growth oriented and goal oriented day and, and grow, uh, and, and your life in, in your business. And, you know, and what I'll tell you is as someone who's been practicing this every single day for, at least the last three months. So I, I, I love it. But one of the things that particularly stood out to me was the community, right? And, yeah. and my first thought is, so I've always been a big believer and you've got to have accountability if you're putting new habits in place, right? So if you're going to get up in the morning, you're going to do whatever it is, exercise, meditate, what have you. Uh, if you've got accountability, the likelihood of it happening is much greater. But, uh, and you talk about this in the book, but the, the scale at which the community has grown, right? Just the, the, the YouTube videos, the Facebook group, like it's just it took a life of its own. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, for, uh, first let me talk about ac your point on accountability. I, I believe it is one of the single most important factors in every person's going to the next level, whatever that is for you. And um, But most people, Michael, I, I feel like we, we inherently resist and resent accountability and we avoid it, right? And and here's my theory on why that is. If, if you think about it, when you were growing up, when you were a kid, accountability was forced upon you without, without your permission, without a request, right? Mom and dad held you accountable to eat your vegetables when you didn't want to eat your vegetables, to take a bath when you didn't want to take a bath, to go to bed when you wanted to stay up late, right? Um, your, your teachers held you accountable to, to focus in school, to do your homework, right? Which, and if we were left to our own devices, I don't know about you, but you know, other than those, you know, few kids that like loved learning and, you know, doing homework, I would have done none of, I would have, I would have been a malnutritioned, uneducated, dirty little kid, right? Like that, that, that would have been our fate. Um, but what happens is because accountability is forced upon us, right? Anything that's forced upon us, we resent, and so then we turn 18 and we leave the nest, we leave home. And for most, like I started staying up till five o'clock in the morning playing Resident Evil 2. You know, I remember in the college, I was playing video games, right? Till, great game, right? Oh man, that they'll suck you in. Um, and it'll also give you nightmares, right? So it's actually not ideal to play before bed. But, um, the, uh, but the, and then, and then, you know, I'd sleep, I literally stay up till 5 a.m. I'd sleep from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Then I'd go to class at 11, right? But the point is for most people, when they leave the nest, it's a downward spiral into like mediocrity, you know, where we accept less than our best because we're trying to, we're now, we're, we're rebels. We're like, oh no, I can stay up late. I can eat crappy food. I can do all these things. And, and, and it's a pivotal time when our brain is still developing. And then most people never get back on track. But if you look at the world's most successful people, show me a, a world champion athlete that doesn't attribute their success to their coach their coach that holds them accountable to eat right, right? Their nutritionist helps them eat right. Their, their coaches help them make sure they show up for practice, make sure they get their reps in. And if it wasn't for that accountability, th there, there's no way they would, for 99%, they wouldn't hold themselves to the same standard. You look at the, any CEO, right? A CEO 
is usually you know a five, Fortune 500 company, right? Yourself, they're, they're, you're revered as you know highly successful. You made it to the top, but show me a CEO that doesn't have to answer to a board of advisors, you know, and, and most have to answer to stockholders and an executive team, and you know, right? There's all these layers of accountability, and if it wasn't for the accountability, we, you know, the, the CEO would be playing on their phone a heck of a lot more often, right? But it's like, oh shoot, I can't. I've got to answer to somebody else or someone else or something else. So to your point, that's crucial. Now, understanding that, I wrote about that in the Miracle Morning. I said, look, this is going to be a very individual pursuit. You're waking up early. The rest of your family or your roommates or whoever's probably still sleeping, right? And it's way too easy once that initial excitement wears off to just fall back into our old patterns. And um, so I created this Miracle Morning community. It was actually a friend of mine's idea. And uh, it's a Facebook group called the Miracle Morning Community. And I had no idea what it would become. I mean, it started out with five people. It was me, my mom, my dad, my sister, and my buddy, John Vroman, and uh, who it was his idea. And he, and he said, Hal, you need somewhere for people to check in, support each other, get accountability partners. I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, it now has 196,000 people in it from over 100 countries, I believe. And, um, and people go in there, and it's one of the most supportive, engaged, and really, I mean, like vulnerable, loving, safe online communities in the world. And people go in there for advice. They go share their wins. Uh, they go in there to find an accountability partner. And they go, hey, I'm in, you know, I'm in London. I'm in Korea. I'm in England. I'm in New York. I'm in California, right? Like, here's the time zone I'm in looking for an accountability partner. And that, you know, that happens, you know, dozens and dozens of times, if not hundreds, every single day. Um, and yeah, I, I, so to your point, it's crucial to have that accountability. And if you're a Miracle Morning practitioner, and I always tell people, I go, look, before you even read the book, go join the community. Like if you order the book and it's coming in on Amazon in a couple days or whatever, um, join the community and just scroll through and it will, like your, your excitement level, your optimism for what this could do for you will go through the roof because you see like it's insane the transformations that are happening for people. People are losing, you know, 20, 30, 50, 90 pounds in a matter of months on the miracle morning. It's not a weight loss thing, but it's, it's really universal where whatever your most important goals are in your business or in your life, this will amplify and accelerate how quickly you will get there and how far you can go. And so that's what the miracle morning is, is this universal thing because everybody shares that they wake up in the morning. That's part of it. But it's what you do in the morning that, again, sets the tone, the direction, and the context for the rest of your day and the rest of your life. So I'm fascinated. This is something I've just, I've, I've always wondered. And uh, we even have this theme at, at our organization. We say never complacent. You know, so it's like the war against mediocrity. But it is so easy, it seems like today, to just simply be mediocre. It's probably one of the most insulting things you could probably call you or me. But sure. uh, it's so easy for the, I think the reasons you described because when you're out in the world and the gloves are off and there's not a person who's either pushing you to do better, right? There's not a, a certain level of accountability. It's too easy to fall into the routine that everybody falls into. The nine to five, you're watching your shows, you know, like you do the, the same types of behaviors that in a way that if you break out from that, you're the outlier, right? You're the, you're the crazy one. There's, you know, yeah. I, I don't, you know, any high achiever that I've seen, whether it's you know in business, in sports, really in pretty much in anything, the things that they're willing to do, right? The sacrifice they're willing to make, the level of commitment is, is much greater. But because of that, they have to face a lot of outward challenges from either the people that you know, in, in their friends, their family, coworkers, and so on. So I guess just I'd love to hear your perspective on like what is your best advice for being able to maintain that level of focus and resilience when you're just surrounded by the world that, that you know, may not align with the same goals that you have, the same mindset that you have, and may not be as focused towards achieving those things. Yeah, there's, there's two things I would say on that. And that is number one is lead by example. I, I really believe that we, you know, I, I spoke earlier about how I feel a sense of responsibility to help people, right? In any way that I can. Um, I, I think at the very least, right? And like I said, you don't have to change the world. You know, some people are driven to do that. I don't even know why I am, but I was, I am, whatever. But, but, but I do believe that we all have a responsibility to the people that we love and the people that we lead. And that the greatest responsibility that we have is to fulfill our own potential. I think I said this, you mentioned this earlier, um, because only then do, can we do help them. And, and, and when I was 20, about 25 years old, um, I had bought my first house and I had two roommates that lived with me and we, we were all in sales. 
and my two roommates, um, uh, I, I was, I was one of the top salespeople in my office and, uh, and they were, you know, they were up there, but kind of, kind of mid-level, you know, like mid-level if you will. And I, um, I had, I had higher average size, like average order size closing percentage was greater than theirs. So meaning I could do less work and still sell as much, if not more as they did. And I was going through a period where I was, I, all my books I was reading were on enlightenment. And I was, it was all about letting go of ego and, and, and all of the things that drove me to succeed up until that point were, you know, breaking records, you know, be, uh, you know, winning competitions, right? All ego driven pursuits. And as I, as I really dove into enlightenment, it was right after my car accident that I drove, dove into this enlightenment. Um, and, uh, I just was like, I want to transcend my ego. Like, why do, why do I need to beat? I don't need to beat someone at something. Well, I don't need to be number one. I don't need, right. What is all the, what do I do? What am I doing all this for? You know? And, um, and, uh, and so my sales dropped off. My work ethic dropped off. Cause I was like, I don't, I have all the things that drove me. They're gone. And all of a sudden one night I had an epiphany and I realized my roommates are suffering because of my level of effort that they're witnessing, right? That, you know, that I'm leading by example, but it's a bad example. And, uh, and, and, and that it, the epiphany, I remember it happened one night when one of my roommates, he's like, I can't pay rent this month. Like what's going on? He's like, man, my sales are just down. And I, and I reflected over the last month and I'm like, dude, I've been staying up late with these guys, playing video games with these guys, watching TVs with these guys. Right. And I'm still able to get by on, you know, talent or, or whatever. Right. You know, resting on my laurels. And, uh, and in that moment I realized I have a responsibility to, uh, to succeed at the highest level that I possibly can, not for me, but for the people that I love and the people that I lead, the people I'm surrounded with. So that's the first thing that I would say is that, um, you know, that mediocrity, right? It's not, it's not about how you live your life. Your level of success isn't just about you. It's about the people around you. And I think we have a responsibility. So for me, I, I believe I have to be the healthiest I can possibly be and eat the foods that I, that will serve the people around me. If you got to eat, right? If you're, if you're hanging out with your friends, right? There's that Jim Rohn quote. We become the average of the five people we spend the most time with, right? And if you're with your friends and they're all eating unhealthy food, you're like, eh. Cool. That, that unconsciously gives you permission to eat unhealthy food, right? And vice versa, right? If, if you're out and you're, you know, if you're, all your friends are getting drunk or whatever, right? You're like, eh, I guess we're drinking tonight, you know? So uh, we are the five people we spend those time, the average of the five people we spend those time with, right? So we need to be the person that elevates the rest of the group, you know? Um, so that's the one thing is first and foremost, you need to decide what you want your life to be about, right? Do you want to fall to the standards of your peers or do you want to aspire and live by the standards that if you're really honest with yourself you know during your miracle morning in those moments of silence those that quiet reflection right who do you really aspire to be what do you aspire for in your life so that's the first thing is the internal decision of i'm going to live to my full potential so that i can a, do it for me, but also do it for the people that I love and those I lead. And the second thing is you've got to upgrade your circle of influence. You have to actively, consciously upgrade your circle of influence. You know, that Jim Rohn quote, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I believe it is arguably, it's one of the most important truisms, philosophies for success, and it is probably the most ignored. I think that 99 point, you know, percent of people, the numbers, you know, irrelevant, um, but they hear that and they're like, yeah, that makes sense. And then they do nothing differently. They don't change. They, they hang out with the exact same people and they do that for their entire lives. I, I think that you have to hear that quote and you need to give yourself a reality check and go and look at the people, make a list. Brendan Burchard teaches this at one of his events. At one of his events, he has you make a list of your, uh, maintenance friends he has you do it like down the, you know, lying down the middle piece of paper, maintenance friends on one side, growth friends on the other side. Maintenance friends are all the people that you, you love. Maybe you've known since high school or whatever, um, but they're not helping you grow. And then your growth friends are all the friends that, you know what? These are people that are aspiring to live to their full potential. They're really going after it in life. They're really, you know, and, and then, and you, you go, okay, these are two important lists, right? I, I'm not going to cut ties completely with my maintenance friends, but I'm going to maintain relationships with them 
at a minimum level to maintain those relationships, but because I don't feel like they're adding to my life, they're not helping me become my best, which therefore means it's not helping me help other people become their best. I'm gonna minimize the time with them. And then the growth friends, I'm gonna actively pursue spending time with these people. And then you can make another list of, you know, my dream friends, right? The dream growth friends. And I've done that and I've consciously reached out. And the, the secret is this, if you go, but how do I develop relations with people that I don't know? You look for ways to add value to their life. Find out what's their favorite charity. Reach out and say, hey, how can I support that charity? How can I donate it? Find out what they're up to. Send them your favorite book. Get it autographed by the, right at my, at the event, right? If, you know, all autographed copy of the Miracle Morning, send it to them. I mean, actively pursue it. It's probably the most important thing you can do. And since I decided to do that, you know, one friend I, I am hanging out with now, and this is, you know, this is financial, but you know, he's worth a hundred million dollars, right? And he flies me around on his private plane. And like, again, that's not to brag, but I met him at an event and I really liked him. Like it wasn't just that he's wealthy, but the point is hanging out with him our conversations are very different from my friends that, you know, that are, are struggling financially. And I love those people and I support them and I have conversations to try to help them grow and bring them up. But the point is, right, who you associate yourself with. And I hang out with a lot of friends. One of my best friends is John Vroman who runs a mastermind called Front Row Dads. And John decided that being a father was the most important role in his life and he needed to align his work with that. And so he started a, a mastermind. In fact, you should, uh, you're, you're a dad now, Michael. You should come join this mastermind. We're meeting uh, in Austin, Texas next month or this, this month. But anyway, um, frontrowdads.com is the, is the site. Anybody wants to look at it. But um, so the point is he's now surrounded himself with high level entrepreneurs that put family first. So that's the, the crux of the group or the focus of the group. The theme is, right, it's, it's, family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. And so by putting myself around those people, again, the conversations I have are, how can we be better dads? How can we be better husbands and still keep our businesses thriving and growing? So um, uh, I know that was a long answer to your question. I'm long-winded, but, uh, but those are the two keys. Number one, elevate yourself, live to your full potential, lead by example. And number two, consciously, actively, strategically pursue upgrading your circle of influence and surround yourself with people that embody the qualities that you strive to embody. So I hope the people that are watching this, listening to this, um, listen to what you just said twice or three times because it's, that, that, is, that is the game. But I imagine there's somebody who's watching this and they're thinking, you know what? How I think it's great you fly around on, on your friend's private plane, you're, you're meeting with all these guys, you're doing all these things, but here I am and I can barely afford to pay my bills and my rent. They, they, they see this huge gap and think that can never be them, right? And I've, and I've found this to be the case sometimes you see this with other entrepreneurs, you see this with, with team members and so on that uh, we all start somewhere, right? So as, as an example, like six, six years ago roughly, when I started uh, Crisp, I started with 500 bucks. I had $500 to my name, period, total, everything. Everybody around me buying new homes, cars, like they're getting ahead, right? They're getting promoted at different companies and here I am with this idea uh, and nothing else, right? I don't feel like the, the man at that point. I don't know that I feel that now, but the, but the reality is that was a starting point and six years from now, you know, here we are. But what would you say to that person that just sees this huge gap and thinks that's, that can't be me, right? They see that it worked out for you, but they, they view it as, you know, perhaps like, I don't know, there was other instances and I'm sure luck plays a role to an extent. I, you know, I, I believe it, it probably did for me, but I also believe that that level of intentionality every single day, those incremental improvements, like th that desire to be better every single day and that focus was the, res you know, resulted in, in, in growing uh, every single year. But I guess I'm just curious from your perspective, how do you address that? Yeah, yeah, and it makes me almost, I was almost cringing to myself as I was talking about the friend with the $100 million in the private jet because I'm like, ah, oh, that, 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 anyway, I didn't mean to even go there. Oh, but, I love it. Um, I hear that and I'm like, man, good for you. But, uh, but yeah, I also I would, know, like, I, well, I, when I say things like that, people, you know, they see this gap, right? Sure. And so here's, so here's the point. I'll, I'll use the John Vroman example. The, the founder of Front Row Dads is a better example. So I was, I was in my early 20s when I saw John speak at an event. And uh, he was an executive in the company that I worked for, that I was in sales. Now, I was earning probably $30,000 a year, maybe $50,000 a year. So it's, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy. Um, uh, you know, I had a, a decent income. But 
Um, but I met John and, and, uh, I, I, I am, I loved John's character, right? So it, it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, he, he wasn't wealthy or anything like that, but he was someone that I decided would, that I, that would be an upgrade in my circle of influence, right? He was, he was very thoughtful. He was very intentional. Um, I just loved his heart more than anything. And, um, and I thought he's someone that I want to, uh, I want to be around now, uh, so he, he has, or he runs a charity called Front Row Foundation. And I, I know, you know, hearing him speak that like, that is where his heart is that, you know, that, that for him is one of the most important things in his life. So I simply reached out and I was like, Hey, what's the best way I can support Front Row Foundation? Right. Again, you don't need, there's no gap, right? This is, you, you know, you, you could, you could be working at McDonald's and meet someone that, right. I mean, you find out what's important. The, the strategy is simple. Right. So, so I get what you're saying is like, you know, you're looking at this, this, you know, this, how, how, how the gap of, of someone uh, that I just described, but, but in terms of, I just reached out and said, how can I support the charity? And he said, Hey, become a monthly ambassador at $11 a month. I said, I'll do that. And so it was $11 a month um, that I started donating. And eventually he, um, I, I, I eventually raised that to hundred dollars a month. Um, I eventually raised that to $2,500 a month years later. Right. Um, and, uh, and then I decided I'd donate a percentage of, of book sales from Miracle Morning. And, and now I think we've donated, uh, we meaning, you know, the, every time somebody buys a book, I, I donate a percentage of the, the foundation. We do fundraisers at our event and you know, now it's, it, it's grown, but it started with $11 a month was how I supported a cause important him. And eventually he reached out and asked me to be on the board of advisors for Front Row Foundation because I had been a consistent supporter. I talked about it all the time. Um, and then, uh, and you know, so on and so forth. So the point is you start small. You know, the point is um, like for me, when I was in my early twenties and I was in sales, I, I, I joined a networking group. You know, there was someone in that networking group that I really wanted to bond with. So I asked him if we could go out to lunch and just get to know each other. During that lunch, I asked him, so what's important to you? Like, what are your passions? What are you focused on? Right. You know, do you contribute? I'm, I'm curious. Do you do things that for fun? You know, you find out what's important to somebody and then you find a way to add value to that person. And that's it, right? That, that's the strategy. And so that, that doesn't, you know, you don't need to be at a, any level of success to do that. You don't need to be wealthy to do that, right? You just need to be intentional uh, to do that. And that's it. That's it. I, I agree wholeheartedly. So shifting gears from, from the Miracle Morning, you've got a new book coming out very soon. I actually think it's coming out uh, next month in, uh, in April, The Miracle yeah. Equation. Uh, talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. So ironically, anybody that follows my work, uh, or even just hears, oh, okay, so you wrote the miracle morning. Now you're writing the miracle equation. It almost sounds, you know, it sounds like a spinoff. Okay. You're, so you're trying to capitalize on the miracle morning brand or whatever the miracle brand. Uh, interestingly enough, the miracle equation is something that I started practicing and living, uh, about six years before the miracle morning was even an idea. I, I think it's, I think I just like the word miracle maybe because I died and came back. I don't even know. Um, but the miracle, when I was 20 years old, uh, it was actually maybe when I was 21. It was after the, right after the accident, like six months or a year after the accident, I was trying to break a sales record. And, uh, it was a, a, we, we were given a very short amount of time. I didn't know until I, I had committed to break the record. And then our manager said, Hal, uh, team, you know, you guys, we only have, th we have only, uh, we have 30% less time during this sales contest than you thought we did. And I got real discouraged. Long story short, I, I was about to give up on the goal. And then I realized, you know what? Even if I don't hit the goal, I'm going to give it everything I have and get to try to hit the goal, regardless of my results. And then I asked myself, what would have to happen for me to reach this seemingly impossible goal in this short amount of time? And I, 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 I narrowed it down to two decisions. Number one, uh, I would have to maintain unwavering faith that I could reach the goal. I'd have to establish the faith that I could do something and, 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 then, and then maintain that faith until the end. And number two, I'd have to put forth extraordinary effort. Now, here's the thing. The, the, the description of that, and that is the miracle equation. Unwavering faith combined with extraordinary effort creates miracles. Now, that's deceptively simple in its explanation. If I just said, if you want to be successful, maintain unwavering faith and put forth extraordinary effort, you'd go... Uh, oh yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know what to do now, right? And that's why it really did require a book. And I've wanted to write a book about it for so long, but here's the thing. And this is what I'll say is, if you study the world's most successful people in any industry, right? The most prolific achievers, innovators, creators, any, in, any, in any industry, you find that 
those are the two decisions that are responsible for their success. You know, in the self-help world, we are taught, you know, there's a million different reasons that we're not fulfilling our potential. You know, not enough knowledge, not enough experience. We need to upgrade our circle of influence. You know, um, we, we don't, uh, you know, it's, it's lack of emotional intelligence. It's, I mean, on and on and on. There's like, you know, there's hundreds of different things that you might go, well, I need to read a book on this. Oh, no, 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 on this. Oh, no, 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 on this, right? But I believe you can distill all of it down to those two decisions. So you study the world's most successful people, you find that number one, unwavering faith, they first established the faith that they could do something they had never done before. And that is counter to our human nature. That is not normal. Where to, to, to commit to something that you look in your past and you have no evidence that you can do it. But the world's greatest, right? They, they had to step out on faith that they could do something they had no evidence they could do. And then the second part of unwavering faith, right, is the faith has to be unwavering because almost all of those people, it was never a straight path. They hit bumps and obstacles and they, they took three steps back and they fell and they failed and on and on and on. But their faith didn't waver. They just kept moving in the forward direction until, and that you got to circle and underline the word until, until they got there. And it almost always took longer than they thought it would. The second component, extraordinary effort, doesn't mean that you've got to work 80 hours a week. Extraordinary really means consistent. It's doing something, even just one thing every day that moves you toward your biggest goals and dreams until, there's that word again, until you get there. Most people, that is again, counterintuitive to our human nature because most of us don't have the faith that we can do something we've never done before. So we don't put forth the effort. And even if we do put forth the effort, as soon as we hit obstacles, the faith goes out the window and the effort goes right behind it. Because you think, well, what's the point of trying? It's not looking very good. It's not looking like I'm going to actually achieve it. But if you do one thing that moves you in the direction of your biggest goals and dreams every day, you eventually get there. And Miracle Morning is a great example. I had this dream. My, my, my initial mission with that was to change one million lives one morning at a time. And uh, it took me a year and a half of constant promotion where I was doing 10 to 20 podcast interviews every single week that I wasn't getting paid for in addition to my coaching and speaking and you know, writing and all the normal work stuff. And I was seeing almost no results. Yeah, I have a graph that shows my book sales. Like for a year and a half, it was like this. And then it hit the tipping point, critical mass. After a year and a half, it went like this. It just, it skyrocketed. And the point is, I had to maintain unwavering faith that I, that I believed in my heart that the miracle morning could change lives, it could change the world. And I had to put forth extraordinary effort each and every day, each and every week, until, and think about that. Most, most authors, you know, we have this, I've had this conversation and they go, man, I promoted my book hard for a month. And then I got, you know, and then entrepreneurial ADHD. I was like, all right, what else could I do? My next book, next project, right? And they go, that's, you know, man, if I would have done it for a year and a half, who knows where my book would be now? You know, and most of us, when, you know, you're promoting the book month after month after month, you know, and after three months, I'm not making much money. I'm not making many sales. Most people would give up, but I was committed until. And so the same, you know, you keep going. It's like, if I would have given up at three months or six months or nine months or 12 months, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but I was committed until. And so that's the miracle equation. And I really felt like it required a book because again, on the surface level, those two decisions are, are kind of woo woo, kind of airy fairy. Like you really have to dive really deep. You've got to go into the case studies. You've got to see the examples. You got to see real life practice implementation of these two decisions but the title of the book is The Miracle Equation, The Two Decisions That Move Your Biggest Goals From Possible to Probable to Inevitable. And I really believe that this book can change lives. It's kind of like my second child. I don't, I don't love The Miracle Morning any more than I love The Miracle Equation. I love them both and I'm committed to, I feel like this is the next step in me fulfilling that mission of elevating the consciousness of humanity one morning, one person uh, at a time. Well, I love it. I, and I, uh, I can't wait to read it. As, as we shift towards the conference coming up this September, what can the attendees of, of the conference, of the, of the Crispy Game Changers Summit, look forward to when you take the stage? Uh, first of all, it's fun. 
Uh, a few years ago, I, I was uh, I went to a I saw a keynote speaker speak, and you know I was kind of like my in my own head thinking of what else I had to do and tuning in and out. And I realized that mo that's most speakers they don't fully keep your attention. And then a few nights later, I went to a, a comedy show. And I watched three hours of comedians. I was really tired when I got there, but I was energized. And I realized that comedians have a different style where they bring you on through a story and then boom, they deliver a punchline. You love it. You're laughing. And they go through this cycle where you're always on the edge of your seat for what they're going to say next. And so first and foremost, I stopped modeling motivational speakers and I started modeling comedians. So that's the first thing is I feel like if you're having fun and you're engaged, right, you're going to get a lot more value. So that's the first thing is I hope you're going to enjoy the time we have together. Um, but more important, uh, you're going to walk away with a deep understanding of, of a few things. Number one is what I call emotional invincibility. And this is maybe not what you expect, but uh, from my car accident, this was the greatest takeaway, the greatest lesson I learned. And that is the ability to be in control of your emotions at all times, no matter what's happening around you, no matter what happens to you, no matter what someone does something, or if you lose something, no matter what, being in control of your emotions so that you can choose, consciously choose which emotion will best serve you in any given moment to take your success to the next level or enjoy the success that you have. And I think that in life, our quality of life begins and ends with our emotional state and our ability to manage it, right? Because in the beginning, you've got to put yourself in a peak emotional state to be motivated and driven and go out there and create success. But then on the tail end, if you get that success, you've got to understand how to manage your emotional state through things like gratitude, right? To actually be present and enjoy and feel good about yourself. So many of us succeed and we're always looking at the, the gap between where we are and where we could be or where the gap between what we accomplished and what we could have accomplished and we don't feel great about ourselves. And our life is never, you know, you see it with celebrities. They're millionaires living the life of their dreams, but they're turning to drugs and alcohol and other vices. You know, it's like, if we don't learn how to manage our emotional state, A, we're not gonna succeed at the level that we could, and B, once we get there, it's not gonna be meaningful to us. So that's the first part of the message. The second part, whether you're a morning person or not, is how do you establish and elevate, create a morning ritual that will radically transform your life and do it faster than you ever thought possible. And the third thing is how do you achieve level 10 success in every area of your life? And this for me is kind of my focus is if we're measuring success on a scale of one to 10, we all want level 10 success. And when I say level 10 success, I don't just mean in your business, your like professional success. I mean, we want level 10 health, level 10 relationships, level 10, you know, income, we level 10 in every area. I've never met anybody that's like, I don't want to be too successful. Like I'll take a level seven or level, you know, it's like, no, no, we all aspire to fulfill our potential up here. Um, but the disconnect I believe is that Jim Rohn quote that I think I said it earlier, uh, our level of success will seldom exceed our level of personal development because success is something that you attract by the person you become. And I've realized in my own life that if I want level 10 success, I've got to assess my level of personal development. And when I first had this realization, I realized I was at like a three or a four. Like this is what I wanted my life to be, but this is who I was and how I was showing up. And so I'm going to teach you how to take your personal development to a level 10 so your level of success will meet you right where you deserve it to be. So those are the main things that you're going to take away from the uh, my message at the Game Changer Summit. Awesome. I mean, again, super grateful to have you. Like this is in a way it's kind of like my guilty pleasure because I'm a, a practitioner of the Miracle Morning and, and I want to share it with, with our entire audience as well. So looking forward to having you at the Crisp Game Changer Summit this September. Um, how is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll close with this that if you're watching this right now, wherever you are in your life or your business, uh, whether you are succeeding at the highest level right now or you're, you know, you're struggling to find your way or, or somewhere in between, um, embrace that where you are right now in your life is exactly where you need to be to learn what you need to learn to take your life to where you want it to be. Um, when things are difficult and they're painful, it's hard to see that. We often get so caught up in like, this is my life, not this is a very, this is a temporary part of my life, right? And, and so many people, we, we, you know, we blow, we make it a bigger deal than it is like our temporary state not realizing that, no, 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 I, I might be at a low point right now. I might be struggling right now, 
but whatever I, wherever I want to go in my life, there is a way to get there. And it might take me a little while, but I'm committed to get there. And when I get there, there's a great quote that says, on the day of victory, no fatigue is felt, right? When you get to the point in your life that you've been working for for so long and, and so hard, you almost never wish it would happen any sooner because it actually, you look back and you go, oh, the struggle was necessary. Those challenges, I needed to go through those to grow and become the person that I am today. So wherever you are in your life right now, be at peace with it while you maintain a healthy sense of urgency to get to the Crisp Game Changer Summit and, uh, and, and just to, to, to move in the direction of your biggest goals and your biggest dreams. Oh. Well, touche again, Hal, thank you very much. Very, very grateful and looking forward to seeing you this September.